from New York City, it's the Mike Douglas Show. Today, Mike is at the Tavern on the Green in Central Park, where he'll be joined by rock star Elton John, fashion star Margot Hemingway, pianist Peter Duchin, and for the first time together on national television, the great names in fashion design, Halston, Calvin Klein, John White, Donna Karen, head designer for Anne Klein Fashion, Adolfo, Princess Dion, and the grand dame of American fashion, Diana Vreeland. Now, here's Mike. New York is the fashion capital of the world. It's the home of the trendsetters who determine what the well-dressed man and woman should be wearing. And today, we are going to meet a few of New York's fashion trendsetters. In fact, one of the most fashionable celebrities in New York is about to join me here at the Tavern on the Green at Central Park. Here is Margot Hemingway. Hi, Margot. How, How are, are you? you? Mm. Wonderful to see you again. And who is this lovely lady? This is um, not only my good friend, but um, who designed both of our outfits, Pr Princess Diane de Beauvau. How do you do? Well, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, indeed. <laughs> Have you ever been on television before, Princess? To be honest, no. Huh? <laughs> Diane, you're very much uh, a part of the New York fashion scene, aren't you? Well, I'm accepted as being one, and I hope to be even more and more and more, because I believe in New Yorkers and be one of the new places where fashion is going to be and where everything's going to happen. And you designed both the outfit Margot is wearing and your outfit? Yes, both of them. And I am planning to design more and more and more. Okay, Margot, describe what you're wearing. Um, well, look at it. <laughs> it's beautiful, <laughs> it's sexy, it moves with the body, it, and I feel comfortable. And is, I that, is that one of the most important things, to feel comfortable in the clothing as well as look, look good? Well, well, you know me. I, I'm I as being, <laughs> from being from the country. I mean, I like to be comfortable, and if I feel good, if you feel good, you're going to look good. And something that just is easy, smooth. I mean, that's the best. Describe the outfit you're wearing. May I call you Deanne? Oh well, of course. Well, I the outfit that I'm wearing is in pure silk, and I love black and I love pants, and I'm always in kind of pants. A little Russian influence there somewhere? No. No? The only influence it could be would be French. <laughs> because I believe in the French creative mood in the designers as well. And actually, I don't think that I've got any influence from anybody. I just believe in my taste. You and were you were a fashion assistant for Halston for yes, a while, weren't you? For one year, I was his first assistant. And that's how we met. When she was with Halston? Yeah, yes. he introduced us. Why, why, why does a girl six feet have to wear th heels to make me look like Mickey Rooney? Because I don't you love mind it with and you. you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Deanne, why did you decide to go out on your own? Well, I've always loved fashion, and I happen to have the opportunity to uh, go on my own, to have the facilities. And I was uh, helped and told by my fiancé that when you've got too many good things for you, give them to everybody, but keep them for yourself as well. <laughs> That's marvelous. <laughs> Having a friend who is in the press and in, who's in the public's eye as much as Margot is not going to hurt your fashions at all, is it? Well, Margot at first is my friend. That's what that I mean. she can help me or that she cannot is totally secondary. I mean, uh, of course, it's a pleasure for me to have Margot wearing my clothes. It's a but pleasure the most for me, too. <laughs> Can a woman who doesn't look like Margot be fashionable? Well, I think that fashion has got... No. <laughs> I mean, yes. it's for every woman. You just have to have class. Margot has class. A woman of any age can have class. I mean, there's a big difference in between elegance and class. Now you quickly said, of course. So let me hear your reasoning for that. Yeah, well, uh, of course, because that's why, why, I mean, I may be a mannequin right now wearing Deanne's dresses, but, I mean, somebody, you have to be, it has to be relatable. And I think, I mean, as long as you make, it makes you feel good wearing it, whatever. <laughs> Both of you ladies have been called jet setters. Are you? Yeah, I take a lot of jets. <laughs> I'm, always, I'm, I'm in the airwaves all the time. <laughs> Are you a jet setter? <laughs> well, let it be said if it wants to be. It's been a joy meeting you, uh, it's Princess. It's been a joy meeting you. And Margot, it's always a joy to see you. I know. May Tuxedo Junction live on forever. <laughs> you really go first class, don't you? You don't kid around. Well, no. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, Margot. Bye, sweetheart. Bye. Well, 
Well, I have to go inside. I'll see you right after these messages. Bye-bye. You're the creator of the Tavern of the Green, the owner. Yes. And this is a marvelous, marvelous place. It's my oh. first visit, but I was just intrigued at what I had seen inside. Thank you. Welcome. Who did all the decor? I did the decor. It wasn't always like this. Uh, it was built in uh, originally in 1871 as a sheepfold. It was kind of a political payoff. And then uh, in 1934, they decided they needed a restaurant in Central Park, so they turned it into a restaurant. And it was sort of going downhill until 1972. And I took it over and you I rebuilt it, it. Yeah, I well, I what built you all mean this. You, you well, this it? wasn't here before. Oh, I see. It was only it was only a very small place. And so I built this. Uh, this room and room in the back. We, we about doubled the size of it, and uh, it's been terrific. It's just Tell me about the origin of the name, Tavern on the Green. Well, when uh, it was turned into a restaurant in 1934, uh, it sort of looked like a tavern. As I said, it was a sheepfold. They used to keep sheep here, and I, no one really knows why, except that they say it was a political payoff that the, in the old days they had someone uh, they had a friend they wanted him to keep a sheep here and he they paid him to keep sheep in Central Park so when they turned it into a restaurant in 1934 uh, they wanted a name that sort of looked like the place and they called the tavern on the green this was all green here see there was no there wasn't a road here or anything so it was all it was all green why do you think it has caught on as it has I think in New York if you do anything that's good and spectacular that people like to come to see it and it really has uh, uh, caught on. I would think it's the highest grossing restaurant in the world today. What kind of people uh, come here? Everybody, I hope. You know, celebrities? Celebrities, uh, uh, people from out of town, uh, uh, local people. That's Socialites? Yeah, that's really what makes it fun. It's kind of a mixture, you know, of everybody. Are you confident that New Yorkers would support a place like this? Absolutely. I think that, uh, that if the one great thing about New York is if you do something that's good, it gets uh, people to come to it. You can be sure of it so far. And you took over the operation, when did you say you took it over? I took it over five years ago, but it took me four years to get the necessary permissions from the city <laughs> and to build it. It was, I had to go through 19 different committees, but you know, all cities are like that. That was not I heard fun. of red tape, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's right. It was ridiculous. Look, a lot of red tape and you're yeah, wearing it. Right. <laughs> right. I wonder, I want you to meet someone, uh, well, my introducing you to this man is uh, ridiculous because the world knows him and certainly everyone in, in New York knows him. He's a very, very talented pianist. Let's wander over there and okay. see him. His name is, is Peter Duchin. Right. And I'm so delighted to see Peter up at this time of the morning. <laughs> morning, gentlemen. Oh, good morning, Mark. You know Warner, Leroy? Hi, Warner. How are you? How are you? Peter, this location is, uh, I think it's perfect for you. Uh, because it's outdoors. And yeah, and you're, you, love the, the you love the outdoors, you said. The Where did your dad have been play? a big uh, park family. Uh, uh, actually, Dad played in a place called the Central Park Casino, which was on the east side, the other side of the park. But a lot of people felt that, uh, I, I know Warner felt that when he redid this place, he wanted that kind of feeling of elegance and, and that Dad used to, you know, have in the Central Park Casino, which was quite a place, I'm told. Except nobody could get in or afford it, but <laughs> other than that, it was great. You're playing in my city tonight, aren't you, Philadelphia? Going out of Philadelphia, and as a matter of fact, we play there a lot and, I know. and enjoy it. You, the kind of music you play, which is you have to be very conscious of dance tempos, I, I know, in playing the kind of music you play, because I remember working with a society band years ago, 
and I remember the leader saying, sing on the beat. Sing on the beat. So they can dance. <laughs> do you, can you incorporate contemporary music into what you do? Oh, we, we incorporate a lot of contemporary music, Mike. We play, but we're not just limited to society type of things. We play everything from college proms, which are coming back, by the way. Oh, sure. To conventions and an awful lot of business industrial shows, things like that. And I also do quite a few concerts with symphony orchestras. Do you have to change your instrumentation uh, for, a, say, a college prom? Well, they usually want a kind of a big band sound, which would mean about 16 men in the band, 14 or 16. Now, I don't use as much as a lot of the people do. And as a matter of fact, we were playing at a prom the other day, and there was a very big rock group. We were outside in a courtyard, and there was a big rock group playing next to us. And they told us to play 30 minutes, and then had the rock group would play 30 minutes. And it was a well-known group. And the rock group sounded, there were only four of them, like about 150 of us, you know, and we were playing away. And the kids came up to me and said, look, we can't dance to the rock group. It's too loud. It's killing us. Oh, so would you mind playing a little extra and just, you play 45 and have the rock group play 50, when and you, I was very happy. When you play for college proms and for college kids, do they do touch dancing, what they call They definitely do touch dancing. Oh, it has so come glad back. coming back. And, uh, you know, I couldn't be happier myself because before, I mean, about five or six years ago, when we played, we almost exclusively played things that, like the frug and the twist, remember those and whatnot, where the kids would be apart and they'd never touch and so if you played a ballad they try and sort of shimmy and wobble and all that kind of stuff and i prefer to touch myself